Oh, a foot spa. Yeah, but it's not just any foot spa. It's a tub above maxi. It's got um, hydrotherapy jets. It's got four removable rollers. Ooh, infrared magnetic field therapies. Yeah, and stimulating notes. Yes, I can read. I can read. Yes, but can you, though, ma'am, without your reading glasses? I've just seen you squinting. Gail, I can read. Well, feast your eyes on this. It's got um, a, a corn removal tool for your... Um... The talk of the street. 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 Hello and welcome to episode 174 of the Talk of the Street, an unofficial Coronation Street catch-up podcast that's convinced that if the show has already forgotten Natasha insisted to fix a sinkhole earlier this year, there's no way we're getting round to prosecuting the roof ninja. I'm Gavin. And I'm not at all smug. <laughs> what a change. <laughs> I'm totally smug. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear listener, what a week it has been at... The talk of the street towers. So Tuesday I went to the doctors because... Wednesday, wasn't it? Tuesday. Was it? Yeah, because I took the day off, I remember. It was the 28th of September. Oh. Huh. So, and actually I'd made this appointment. This is this is just the way things are in our pandemic world. I called my doctor a month ago and said, you know, I'm still not feeling great, you know, and I'm really, really fatigued, like I cannot... I cannot get through the day without laying down and taking a nap. And they said, okay, we can see you a month from now. <laughs> I thought you went to your haircut here. This is, <laughs> this is somewhat serious. Right, yes. Um, and I'd been diagnosed with strep in at around the end of July. We might need to explain what that is to UK listeners. Because I don't, it's either called something else or we don't get it. Because I'd never heard of it. A streptococcus bacterial infection in my throat, um, which can also affect other parts of the body, which we'll get to. We're going to go that far away. <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, so I finally get there and I walk in and they're like, and they go through the list and I'm like, well, you know, I do still kind of have a sore throat. And they're like, right, that's it. Back to your car. The doctor will call you. 15 minutes of sitting in my car playing Pokemon Go later. <laughs> the doctor calls me. We chat a wee bit about, you know, what the fatigue might be. I mentioned that I do still have a sore throat and that I did have strep earlier, you know, in the summer around the time that I called them. And she's like, well, I'll send someone out to swab you and 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 we'll see if maybe... Your throat. Yeah. Well. Just to be clear. <laughs> my throat and my nose because uh, she did a COVID test as well. She's like, we might as well. Yeah. You're here. Might as well just cross them both off. So I do that. And then I'm, I'm, I'm driving to Lansing because I have to pick up a tie-dye kit. And they call me. You still have strep. And I say, what the fuck? <laughs> Swing already, like your doctor. I already had strep. Well, if you didn't keep before me waiting now, for a month. Before, before now, the last time I had had strep was like 30 years ago. Which we talked about here. Yes, we did. And I was like, it, how is this possible? How am I still getting it? And she's like, well, either the antibiotics that we tried last time didn't work well enough. So we'll put you on different antibiotics this time around. But it also could possibly be that someone else in your household has it and keeps reinfecting you. And at this point, all our listeners put two and two together <laughs> and come to the correct <laughs> conclusion. So by the time, so I stop at the store and before I go in, I call you and I say, Gav, I have strep again. You should probably go get tested. And you say. I'm too busy. And. I'm I'm fine. So all week long. Because I don't have a sore throat. 
Cause I don't have fatigue. I had a bit of a sore head a couple of weeks ago. So, but, <laughs> but generally, I'm as I'm as well as I'm as I normally am. Which I guess doesn't attest for how you normally. Know <laughs> well, when it, there's a gradual decline, you don't really notice, I guess. <laughs> So all week long, I'm expecting you to go because you're because what I heard was, I'm busy today, but I'll I'll do it eventually. It gets to Friday. I'm quite irritated and also still quite sick, and say, get down there and do you, get do you, tested. Dear listener, where you hear quite irritated, you can put in any <laughs> adjective you like instead of quite. And so you're like, oh, fine. And then what happens, Gav? I've got strep. <laughs> I had to sit for two hours waiting for a, for them to swab my throat. The interesting thing is that she's even out. She goes through all these symptoms, explaining why I'm here and why I'm getting. And this, we will get to Coronation Street, I promise. <laughs> <clears throat> While I'm sitting there uh, going through the questions of, you know, explain your symptoms. I'm like, well, I don't really have any symptoms. I'm only here to satisfy my uh, hypochondriac wife. <laughs> and um, and uh, so it's like, do you have? fever I'm like no do you have a sore head no do you have a sore throat no and it's blah 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 blah. so she asked like about 50 different things and i'm all like nope nope everything's good do you have a rash <laughs> well funny you should mention that because for the past couple of months i've had this really interesting thing going on and it's not sore and it's not itchy so she says right we'll, we'll get you swabbed and i start googling what this rash is what, what the strep rash is and goes oh god that looks like exactly what i have <laughs> oh well this rash that for like two months i've been telling you you need to go get checked <laughs> out don't because rubbing some neosporin and <laughs> and cream on it hasn't been helping well they do initially and then they stop <laughs> but it hasn't been bothering me so i haven't really been it's not itchy it's not sore it looks worse than it is. Anyway, it's, it's kind of going down now since I've started taking those antibiotics. Oh, anyway. it's funny how that works. <clears throat> <laughs> so there we go. So now I, now I feel sick since I started taking these pills last night. Yeah. Now, I, now I start to feel sick. So trigger warning. Also funny how that works. If, if hearing people sniff. And cough. <laughs> ain't your bag. And, and laugh like they have a 10 pack a day habit. Well, you were laughing like Motley last week. Right, because I was sick with strep last week. <laughs> anyway, I think that takes us to the banter <laughs> section of this. How was your week otherwise? That was fine. <laughs> Shall we preamble, my dear? Yes, please. Give us some of that strepococcalus or whatever it is. <laughs> Corey News. Well, Billy and Todd may be Splitsville. Daniel Brocklebank and Gareth Pierce continue to be hashtag friendship goals. The pair took a mini vacation together in Wales, enjoying long walks and waterfalls. Long walks and waterfalls. Long walks and waterfalls. What could that possibly mean? <laughs> that they took long walks beside waterfalls. And sure. And took pictures of them and pos posted them on the Insta. Let's go with that. Yes. Friendship goals. Sue Nichols owes her life to her role as Audrey in a very literal way. When a viewer of the show spotted an unusual mole on her shoulder, Anna Bianconi Moore, a dermatology nurse, Good job. noticed the spot back when Audrey was getting down with Nigel Havers. Oh. She contacted the show's medical team who referred Sue to a skin tent scan. Yeah, skin. Oh, my worst job there. You did better <laughs> on, the, on the tricky name. Who referred Sue to a skin cancer specialist oh. who removed the offender, which was indeed a malignant melanoma. Sue invited Anna to the show to thank her in person with a cheeky wee GNT. Very nice. Now, if only we could uh, see her liver from, <laughs> from the camera. Audrey's, yeah. Yeah. Ha 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 ha. The current petrol shortage in the UK has hit home for one Cory actor. Could use some petrol. Mm-hmm. Jack P. Shepard was forced to abandon his forty-one thousand pound, almost almost did it, Mustang on his way to filming and had to get a lift from his girlfriend's sister, Ox. <laughs> he was talking about that 
about the mileage that gets out of that car, which I think when he says when he fills it up, it's it gives them two hundred fifty miles. Yeah, but in actual fact, it's it's more like one hundred and fifty. Right, and he doesn't even drive it really? that fast because I don't know what kind of petrol is he using. I don't know. Appar- apparently, people there are doing the thing that people here did. The, it, at the beginning of the summer when they thought we were going to have a fuel shortage. Fill up everything. Filling up plastic shopping bags full of... <laughs> Just really... And then throwing them in the trunk liquid, of his car. People. It's a liquid. Mm. It's it's always nice to see evidence that people are just as dumb there as they are here. Yeah. yeah. And that's Corey News. That people was are the dumb. Item. Yeah, it was the items. People are dumb all over the world. A <sighs> mailbag. I haven't done mailbag in forever. What? I just wanted to mention that Freeway Heart gave us a five-star review on iTunes this week. Yay! Headed up perfectly sized portion. Mm. Always nice to hear. Really enjoy this podcast. Great review of Corey and generally the perfect amount of time. Not too long. Love the banter between the hosts. Aww. Although maybe not this week. <laughs> really appreciate when people take time to review rate and review. Yes, it always helps. It pops us up. The it does. It really does. The algorithm a little bit. Or yeah. so I'm led to believe. Yeah. And now we'll podcast for coffee. Thank you to everyone who gave us coffee money in September, which I sent off to rescue.org this week. 220 bucks wow. in total. Pretty pleased about that. Absolutely. And just sneaking under the wire to be included in that was Laurie. Laurie says, love your podcast. Please talk about Zidane's hair. And And also, we really didn't see Zidane this week. We didn't. And I don't know if I have enough time left on this memory card (laughs) to do it justice. Maybe next week. Maybe next week. (laughs) But thank you so much for your donation. Really appreciate it. And now we move into October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we can do something similar. I would very much appreciate that. Yeah. No, I As had, someone with breasts. I, <laughs> well, apparently men can get breast cancer too. Yes, men can get breast cancer. That's that's a very important fact. I think um, was it Quincy Jones had breast cancer at some point. Somebody had breast cancer. A man had, a, a famous man once had breast cancer and talked and actually talked about it. News at 11. <laughs> My so, aunt also had breast cancer, so this is, uh, and and my close friend last year died of breast cancer, so yeah. This it's is still a thing. Near and dear to our hearts. So for the month of October, please continue to buy us coffees through ko-fi.com, that's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. But for the month of October, we will be forwarding those donations to Breast Cancer Research Foundation, BCRF. So we'll be doing that for the month of October. So if you want to be part of that, it's ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the, the, talk of the street. street. And now it is Hindsight Corner. A bloop, 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 bloop. What is the deal with Simon and Zidane? Aha. We, we threw out the, the um, collective net. Yes. And both of the people that me- both of the people that we mentioned in that collective net were the two people who got back to us, uh, and two other people got back to us as well. Yes, so thank you to John and Scott, and also to other people. And thank you to Nancy and to uh, Wonder Woman Unicorn Eight. Wow, who I think has the best name out of that lot. <laughs> <laughs> they Sorry, got, Scott. They all got in touch to tell us the same thing. About seven years ago, Leanne was with Zidane's dad, Cal, and Zidane played a bit of an influential role in young Simon's life. Mm-hmm. Cal would go on to be blown up in the Victoria Court fire in 2015. Ah, well. And now this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, welcome to last year tonight with me, John Oliver. Just enough time to quickly talk about Rutting Chimp Man. Rutting Chimp Man? Mm-hmm. Is that, is that like a puppy monkey baby? I don't know, but I'm going to say yes. 
good improv, you always say yes, right? <laughs> That's right, this was Carla getting stuck into Adam and his tendency to lurch his way into people's pants like a lurching chimp man, <laughs> said Carla, who used to be in the show. Carla? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I might remember her. Carla? Dark hair, I'm going to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Propensity towards leather. Mm. But not like that. <laughs> well, was, maybe like that. I was Gavin and you were cancelling your hydrocortisone prescription. Did I say that right? I think I said that wrong. No, no, you said it right. Did I say it right? Yeah, I have no idea what that means though. Nor do I. <laughs> You'd gone hiking for 11 miles on Sunday and put your shoulder out on Monday thanks to an ill-fitting bra. Yeah. And I was like, who puts their shoulder out putting on a bra? And you were like, women. <laughs> After six months in flip-flops, I forgot how to put on socks. Which foot do I go first? <laughs> what do I lean on? I was two days off the beer at that point. Congrats on your first year, first full year of sobriety, by oh, the way. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Carla puts aside her own relationship issues to get involved in Sarah and Adams, resulting you in... You that Carla person again. I know. <laughs> Who is she? Who is Carla? <laughs> I'll need to do a feature on YouTube. <laughs> Resulting in all manner of office supplies flying around Adam's office. This was one of my favourite bits of. Oh, is this the flying year. stapler? This is when episode. I started to learn how to use iMovie. Because <laughs> she threw the stapler at him, it, it bounced. bounced off the window, and it landed, and it landed, and it made a wooden noise <laughs> on the show. It made a wooden <laughs> noise when it landed, and I thought they've put the wrong sound effect in there. <laughs> Which inspired me to put other wrong sound effects in there, like a duck quacking and a dog barking and a squeeze toy squeaking. Paul may or may not be moving furniture for Rita, the lifelong Shane McGowan fan. The German doctors have news for Leanne regarding Oliver's condition, while Nick is elsewhere wrestling with the fact that he's hiding a secret son. Peter's... Peter? Now, is Peter related to Carla? I don't know. I see, it's Peter and Carla, isn't it? Or Carla and Peter. The two Maybe. kind of go well together. Maybe. I think I think they both have fabulous hair, though. If I'm remembering correctly. Right. Yeah. If anyone has any idea, please write yes. in to tell us. Who is Peter? And who is Carla? Do, and how do they know each other? Fight. His preference for monster flakes is not the problem. Tim's electric <laughs> toothbrush is on the charger. And not a single person mentions the sinkhole. Our moment of the week was Michael finding out that, that sinkhole has existed for, for more a than year. year. Yeah. Our moment of the week was Michael finding out that Tiana wasn't his kid. And our boring moment of the week was Maria yammering on about her honeymoon pictures because she'd just got back from wherever it was with Gary. Mm -hmm. And that was Coronation Street and the talk of the street. This time last year. Shall we dive in, my dear? I ask, please. Yeah. A year of sinkhole. A year of sinkhole. <laughs> it's like a novel by... You've been sober as long as that sinkhole has existed. <laughs> Maybe my sobriety is what's maintaining the, the sinkhole. Maybe you just, like every night, just walking onto the set and pouring beer down the sinkhole. <laughs> and it's just metaphorically going down your gullet. A year of sinkhole. It's like a novel by Gabriel <laughs> Garcia Marquez. <clears throat> Oh, what a reference. <laughs> Our first storyline this morning is New Max Headroom, which we're still agreeing is a good title. Yes. On Monday, Max is now pretending to be scared to go into school and insists to David and Shona that he definitely didn't take that wallet. David promises to sort Daniel out. Shona, though, still isn't falling for this, but David decides to call the school to complain. Meanwhile, Daniel <sighs> is in Roy's roles when he gets a call from the school asking him to come in for a meeting ominously. Dum, dum, dum. And it's so important that I think he abandons his coffee. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, at home, David has found more of Max's homework, so grabs it and heads off to hand it to him at school. Who does that? What kind of parent would find homework and <laughs> rush into school to make sure that it... Yeah, Yeah, I'm raising my hand, but yeah. in fairness to me, we live less than a mile from the school. Yeah, It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it's like a 10-minute walk. Yeah, if that... Daniel and David are both in the deputy head's office and Mrs. Crawshaw, she's, uh, uh, she's the one that's been 
tasked to sort this shit out. Mm -hmm. She goes over the allegations made in the smashed lasagna. <laughs> David wants an apology. So Daniel apologises for everything but refuses to withdraw the accusation that Max stole the wallet, which 22% of her Twitter followers blamed Norris for. <laughs> so, so David changes his tune and he now wants Daniel sacked. Mrs. Cranshaw, was it Cranshaw or Crawshaw? Crawshaw. Mrs. Crawshaw draws the meeting to a close as it's no longer been productive and David goes off to find someone to give him satisfaction. But not like that. No. Back home, Shona thinks this has got out of control. David expects more from her. She's supposed to be Max's stepmom. And Shona tells David to chew on a big old bag of dicks and leaves, which presents <laughs> a problem because there's a guy coming to see about the sinkhole later. Right. And also Lily needs to get to school because apparently there's someone named Lily on the show. Now, is, are they related to Carla? I don't, I don't think so. Right. But maybe. Who knows? I'm having a lot of fun with this, by the way. Mm. At the school, a fretful Daniel wonders what the next step is. Mrs. Crawshaw suggests just waiting for David to calm down, but reckons that Daniel's behaviour has been unacceptable in all this, and he, sh and he should consider the apology. Right. It's, better, it's better to be kind than to be right. Something, something Daniel should take to heart right. in all aspects of his life. Yeah. Yeah, the sooner the better. <laughs> Max is in Dev's been a cheeky shit and buying lunch, and he tries to use a, uh, a credit card. But and buying a lot of lunch. Mm, an odd amount of lunch to be buying, which yeah. Dev remarks upon, because yes. it's going to be like, like 16 quid or something. Right. That's like four lunches at least. But it's declined. And rather than hang about and argue the, the point, mm -hmm. Max quickly rushes off. Right. And later, Daniel is in his room... In his classroom, not and his bedroom. And see, this is this is this is the one problem with the whole like chip, dabby thing, mm -hmm. is that you don't have to hand your card over to the person who says, "Wait a second, this isn't your name." Nobody checks that these days. Nobody checks a signature on a card. No. No. In fact, when you actually have to sign for something, you can just do a random squiggly yeah, you line. Yeah, a little squiggly it. line. You don't even. You put nobody's no checking or that. Right. Nobody's checking that. And we've all agreed that nobody's <laughs> checking that. Somehow there's been this agreement through through customer service representatives mm. and people that are working in cash registers and the general public. We've all decided that nobody's checking that anymore. Yeah. I used to write, um, please check ID underneath my signature so that, you know, a person would be forced to ask for my ID. What an asshole. Yeah. I did that for a while until I was just like, oh, for fuck's sake, this is so, I don't want to have to pull out my ID every time anymore. So I stopped writing it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you're getting out of that. So that if somebody did steal my card, they would have to have their ID checked and they would obviously not be me. Oh, you wrote it under your signature on the... Card, yeah. Oh, not the signature on the, on, on the receipt. No. No, I misunderstood. And I, was, and I, and I had questions. <laughs> <laughs> so later, Daniel's in his classroom when Mrs. Crawshaw comes in. Shit just got real, she says. David's reported Daniel to the cops for assaulting Max and ruining a perfectly serviceable lasagna. <laughs> Dev drops in to see David and explains his encounter with Max and the declined card. David thinks on his feet and explains it was his card and he's gone over his overdraft limit. Yeah, totally my card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dev doesn't look impressed, but leaves it at that. David calls the school again to make sure that Max returned after lunch. Dev does say, you know, if you're on hard times, pal, you know, we can just let me know and, and I can help you out. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised at how... Uh, kind. Well, how kind Dev is, but also how uh, blasé David is about going over his overdraft limit. Right, yeah. You're... You're, That's serious shit happening when you go over your overdraft limit. You're a business owner. Right. Yeah. It must affect your credit rating. Right. So <laughs> this isn't this isn't the only business owner who seems a bit blase about things like to. this this week though. When Max gets home, David throws a fucking fit on. And I, he actually does. Yeah, he does. Sit down. And sharp. Yeah. Yeah. He actually puts the fear of God a little bit. Just a little bit. A little bit into Max. He knows about Dev and he demands Daniel's wallet, which Max sheepishly hands over. And he asks if David plans on dobbing him in. 
The tension is released when Gail comes home, wondering about the sinkhole. So the sinkhole guy finally shows up and gives them a quote advising David that he really needs to get this sorted. Yeah. It's, it's only been a year it's, after all. It's, it's been a year. And, and Gail tries to talk the price down a wee bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's... You're... you're Advertising says best prices, but this is the same price as all the other guys that we've gotten in here to look at the sinkhole. <laughs> I still don't understand why it's their responsibility to get a, a, an act of God, essentially, fixed. Well, we need to start talking at some point about Super Soap Week that's coming up. Because we've been making a big deal about this. We're moving towards something. Yeah. And I think there are things that are in flight at the moment that are in flight because of Super Soap week, week coming up. Yeah. One being the sinkhole. Yeah. Two being the parking situation on the street. And three, Audrey's eyesight. And I think all of this... <laughs> Audrey's going to drive a car into the sinkhole? <laughs> she can't get parked on the street. <laughs> like something like that's going to happen. Here, I was just thinking that Abby was just going to drop Corey into the sinkhole. Who knows? Which I really, I don't want that to happen. I don't want anything bad to happen to Corey because then Kelly doesn't get off. He needs to be prosecuted in order for this to be good, not dead. So we'll we'll touch on some of these points later. Yes. So Shona is disappointed and wonders if Max is even sorry. All Max cares about is if David is going to grass him up and he disappears upstairs, leaving David to call Mrs. Crawshaw to sort this shit out once and for all. Mm. Daniel is in the rover listening to Daisy recount some of her nastier exploits at school as Daniel reveals that he's been suspended pending a further investigation. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be a teacher anyway, says Daisy. Uh, You did. Didn't you? Asks Daniel. Squirrel, shouts Daisy. And then Ken comes in. (laughs) Daniel explains the situation to Ken who tells the tale of the time he decked Aidan Critchley in school and ended up getting prosecuted. It's weird that you've never told that story to me, says Daniel. Isn't isn't it? Says Ken. (laughs) I'd never heard about this before. Then Daniel gets a call from the school. David has withdrawn his complaint. I watched that punch uh, from, well, in inverted commas, the punch from Ken to Aidan Critchley. Mm-hmm. I didn't realise how old Aidan Critchley looked in that <laughs> at that time. It is Judd Nelson in the Breakfast Club type of... What the fucking earth is he doing in school? Yeah, it's Ben Platt continuing to play Evan Hansen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Daniel finally listens to the plot and goes to Dev's and hears all about Max's declined card and David's excuse. Hmm. Really, says Daniel. Very interesting. So he goes off to see David and thanks him for dropping the complaint. Wouldn't have anything to do with Max's declined card, would it? David sticks Yang. to the story and even though no one believes it, Daniel lets it go. And Shona hears all this and privately chastises David for demonstrating to Max that stealing and lying is A-OK. Yeah. <laughs> You, you 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 don't think of the Platts as being one of the more underhanded. It's not a crime and, syndicate. Yeah, and yet, <laughs> <laughs> and yet they do kind of act like one. Mm-hmm. Collection of dead bodies under the patio, <laughs> or Gail's annex. On Wednesday at number eight, Max is being an asshole about his headphones while David is trying to warn him to stay out of trouble at school. Kids and headphones, man. Yeah. Remember when we used to get on Nick about wearing headphones at the table? Oh, vaguely, yeah. Yeah. We were concerned about that for a while. Yeah, Maybe. you were very concerned about it. You were always like, it's rude. It Take rude. your headphones off at the table when we're eating, especially in public. You're being very rude and disrespectful to the waitress. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Now he finds other ways to be rude and disrespectful <laughs> to the waitress. But at least he can hear them. <laughs> So, <clears throat> David is trying to warn... <laughs> Shona wonders what the point is if David's going to lie for him. And Daniel has completed a lesson and no one has killed anyone or stolen anything and everyone's lasagna is still intact. Mm-hmm. He's even impressed with Max's contributions to the class and Max does a decent <laughs> impression of pretending to be interested in what was going on. Mm-hmm. Later, it looks like Shona was right because next we see Max complaining to David about still being grounded for the wallet thing when no one's going to find out about that because David's lied for him. Because he wants to just go about his normal Right, yeah. Now. He's like, I'm just going to fuck off and go away because it's not like you're going to tell anybody. <laughs> Daisy <laughs> runs into Daniel, who's in a much better mood. He thanks her for her ear earlier and they arrange to meet up later for drinks and maybe food and then sweet, sweet love. 
Daisy seems genuinely With excited the about this. Right. <laughs> Would I this, just this happen to you? have this cardigan that's just your size. You know, while we're just checking out each other's piccadillos and stuff, mm. I have a cardigan here that... <laughs> would you mind just seeing if it fits? Nice. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> it's almost as if... It's, it's almost as if... You're reenacting something from real life. I'm giving this far too much thought. <laughs> but Daisy does seem... I'm hiding all of my cardigans now. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> Daisy, Daisy seems genuinely excited for once. And doesn't seem like she's got anything underhanded going on. No. She just looks like she's quite looking forward to having... Yeah. She does at one point suggest him just stop being a teacher and, and travel the world with, with a sexy companion by his side and after, then flips her hair after selling a house worth half a million or right yeah. yeah which he declines but still you mm-hmm. know so there was a little bit of maybe there's still something you're right. yeah okay. underhandedness but not as much at home shona is shocked to learn that max is off out when he's still grounded david has lost control of the situation he spots max on the street and yells at him to get inside max sees daniel and daisy on the other side of the street Knows that he has the upper hand, so it's all like, nah. Should have grasped them up, says Shona, helpfully. And that's yeah. as far as we get with that this week. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh. It's 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 funny that this is happening when a child in this house <laughs> was grounded this week and kept forgetting that he was grounded. Yeah, he doesn't forget <laughs> that he's grounded. It's a, it's a lie that, that, that they think... Oh, well, they seem to be believing this. There's no way in the world we believe in this. No. I wonder what David does hope to achieve by backing Max to the hilt here, who's just been an utter shit to everyone. I think I think he's just more covering his own ass. Right, so it's and, like and not, Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and keeping himself from embarrassment. It's more about Daniel's feelings than Max's. <laughs> I still think this is a crappy storyline. The, there was less shouting this week, yes. I guess, which is better. Yeah. But it was hilarious when, when Mrs. Crawshaw yelled at Daniel and David. Yeah. Stop it, boys. And then she apologizes for calling them boys. But she but was they, playing the role of you from last week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But she was exactly right. You know? They were acting like children. Right. The t- both of them. <laughs> It seems unlikely that the feud between Max and Daniel and David and Daniel is is over. Is it? Or is that it? What a nothing burger that was if that is it. Yeah. But I'm not sure how far it could go now. Well, Daniel could just... Da- could punch him. The, 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 the wallet could accidentally fall out of David's pocket or oh, something. Surely he's not carrying that about. I wouldn't surprise me, though. <laughs> I would not surprise or, me. Or, you know, Daniel has to go to his house... Go to, go to David's house for something and the wallet slips out or Max slips up again. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but you're right. It is, it is a bit of a nothing burger and it All it's doing is really establishing Max has been a bit of a dick. A dick and a horrible character now. He had his moments of being a dick before, let's be honest. He did stomp up the stairs quite a bit. Yes. Yes, and then there was that incident where he was getting in trouble and he, he opened his heart to Craig. Who then, did they talk about this again? <laughs> who, who then walked out the door on him. So, you know, that's been festering for about a year and a half now. So no wonder, longer, no wonder, yeah. no wonder Max has turned to a life of, of pickpocketing. Mm-hmm. And, and stealing sweets from Rita that we'll get to. Right, yes. Yes, again, <laughs> something he essentially got away with as a child, so no wonder he thinks it's okay to steal. Yeah, he got away with something that Audrey covered for. Yeah. Again, we'll get to that. Yeah. Our next storyline in the meantime is Fashionina. On Monday, Okay. Roy is off to the wholesalers, leaving Nina in charge. In comes Asha, and she's off to the Imperial War Museum on a school trip. And she's very excited about it. Hugely excited about it, and this new opportunity to learn. 
Hmm. She apologises for what she said in court and asks if they can be friends. And Nina's game for that. And it was interesting to see on Twitter how uh, people who know the area mm-hmm. posted a map of the Imperial what, what's War. right over the wall from ITV Corrie is the Imperial War Museum. <laughs> so it's like, well, you just basically like cross the road. Yeah. That was hilarious. It's still exciting. It reminds sure. me. It reminds me of school trips, growing up in Canterbury, walking down the hill to the Prudence Crandall Museum every year to to walk through the Prudence Crandall house and, and hear again how her neighbors poisoned her well because she had the audacity to teach black children how to read and write in the, in the first in the first boarding school for for. For black children in America. Oh, I didn't realise that's what that was. I mm-hmm. actually kind of interested in seeing inside that now after driving past it for <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> My school trips were always to Curious. Yeah. The best school trip, though, growing up was to the, the Frito-Lay factory. Where you got free chips mm-hmm. at the end. It's like going to Walker's. And it smelled delicious. So anyway, Roy gets back and chats to Nina about some of her new sketches on napkins. Less dark, he says. Maybe she's in a less dark place. And she throws the napkins out and Roy worries that she's feeling useless and purposeless. She needs more than this cafe in her life, he says. So Nina has taken Roy's advice, grabbed her portfolio and decides to go and speak to Carla. Who? Okay, we've done that. Yeah. Speak to Carla about getting her old designer job back. Yeah, unfortunately we don't get to see that meeting. No. Nina comes back with bad news. Carla doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> no, Carla has already replaced her. Knickers need designing in the meantime, so Roy suggests trying somewhere else, but Nina only got the underworld gig because she knew the boss. Roy suggests a course then, go back to college. When in doubt, <sighs> go back to education. Right, yeah, which, fair point, but also, it doesn't really matter how she got this first gig. The fact of the matter is, she's had a first gig, mm-hmm. something to put on her CV. A bit of experience. Yeah. Right, yeah. So... It would be worth, you know, putting feelers out as well. But, oh, well, she's going back to school. On Wednesday, Asha goes to see Nina at Roy's Rolls. Nina's putting samples together for a fashion course at Weddy College. Asha takes a look and is very impressed. Nina wonders if Asha would mind modelling some of the outfits and Asha is only too pleased to accept. Now, if if you are part or used to be part of a relationship Mm -hmm. that is no longer a relationship Mm -hmm. and you wonder on kind of our... uh, a little fretful that the former partner still mm-hmm. has feelings for you. Would you ask them to model some of your clothes? If it kind of feels like Nina is throwing Asha a bone just to be nice. Oh right, okay. And well, also, that's almost leading her on. And almost you know, and also I mean, who else is she going to get to model for her, Broy? I'd pay money to see that. <laughs> it does look good in a dress. <laughs> So Asha gets all dolled up in Nina's sample, not Which, like that, but in haste to fasten herself up. She appears to have torn something off the outfit. At least that's what I think had happened. I wasn't really sure. She was trying to, she was trying to get the zipper up. There was something wrong with the zipper, and in trying to get the zipper up, she it seems like she got the zipper kind of some of the tulle because the um, skirt is made of tulle, um, and then the bodice is black sequency. It looks very. Mother of the Bride-ish, if I'm honest. It doesn't really feel like oh. something Nina would make. But I digress. The only thing that's Nina-ish about it is it's black. Some fashion critique that no one was expecting this week. But yeah, it's tool rips very easily. Tool? Yeah, that's that. that T-O-O-L. T-U-L-L-E. Oh. It does rip very easily. Does so. It? Yeah, which is why it's not typically used. It's u- typically used as like for under the skirt to give the skirt more yeah. volume, not really as an outside bit. But what else? And it's no biggie though, and Nina can sort it. In comes Roy as Nina is explaining her mending process. The whole place is getting turned into a haberdashery, but Roy's okay with that. And then he explains Kelly's sentencing from another storyline. Mm-hmm. Nina calls it partial justice. Dress fixed, Nina takes some glam pics of Asha in her outfit. Yes, in Roy's rolls, with the shades drawn, which, and not far enough away to actually really get very good. She should be outside 
taking these pictures. With a, one or of those fancy with, mirrorless cameras that they have these days. Or somewhere with better lighting mm-hmm. than inside Roy's Rolls with all the curtains drawn and no natural light getting in. And all yellowy, the light inside. I did kind of hate it when Nina started to explain to Asha about what punk was. <sighs> like she was there. Yeah, that... The pistols and the clash. Yeah, the pistols. Are they not allowed to say sex? On on Coronation Street, are they not allowed to say sex? It's often shortened down to pistols. Is it? Mm-hmm. Not here. Of course, in America, we like saying the word sex. <laughs> A lot. Here's Helen speaking sex, for sex, 320 sex, million sex, people again. Sex, 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 sex. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, an awful lot of, because she seemed, Nina also seems to have gone back to kind of this smarmy, sarcastic, kind yeah, of, of it. weird, kind of, not weird, but, you know. She flicks her head people, an awful lot as she's saying things again. And, and she's hmm. talking about, I don't smile, I'm a goth, you know, and doing very much what straight white men who've never put black lipstick on would think a goth would say, as opposed to, <laughs> you know, the character we've come to know and love. And that was kind of... Yeah, I felt she I, was... I was not I was not a fan of Nina this week, no, which is I weird she because I love strangely. Nina. Yeah. yeah. Something happened there. No, I've given up the whole spoon thing, you know. Not mentioning that, you know, because of COVID, you don't really want to put a spoon out saying, yes, please, come sit with me. Less than six feet apart. <laughs> Anyway, ah. Roy catches the end of this and <coughs> Asha goes off to get changed back into her other clothes which allows Roy to observe that Asha evidently still cares about her and Nina insists, yeah, but just as a friend. Yeah, and, and Roy, you know, is like, do, do you think do you think this is a good idea? <laughs> mm-hmm. On Friday, Nina is in devs chatting to Asha ahead of her interview at the college. That certainly escalated quickly and Asha wishes her good luck. Then Tim comes in he bursts in, announcing to Asha and Nina that ITV Corey has been promoted to Weather County's first team and he's ready to burn his jersey in protest. Nina can't deal with this, so she leaves. Right, and then Asha yells at, at Tim. Because mm-hmm. Asha is now Nina's mum. Right. It was nice to see Tim, though. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen an awful lot of Tim lately. No. Later at Royal Rolls, Nina reveals to Asha that she's been accepted on at the course. Woohoo! And then later still, Nina is reading out a Weather Gazette article about ITV Corey's meteoric rise to the ranks. Inexplicably, inexplicably, Kev is there, and he reckons he knows just the fellow to speak about all this and getting it sorted out. Hmm, who could it be? Because Kev has remembered could it be? that there's a Weather County player <laughs> living right on the street. <laughs> so he goes to see James to talk him into getting ITV Corey kicked out. James points out that ITV Corey was found not guilty for promises to speak to the manager. And also that he's just now getting back in the game after his injury. Which is true. From, you know, police brutality and the, the is already kind of feeling a bit anxious that, you know, him calling out police brutality is going to get him dinged on the team. He doesn't want to rock the boat with a manager about ITV Corey. Right, and because he's already that. rocking the boat Especially about when police brutality. ITV Corey has been found not guilty. Right. Because Kev doesn't seem to care about justice like that anymore. It might be wrong, and we all know that it's wrong. Yes. But what can anybody do about this? So... At the garage, Tim is nattering to Kev about a text that Kev got from James. The manager basically told James to mind his own fucking business. So Tim and Kev decide to take matters into their own hands, fan power, and they go off to speak to the manager. Meanwhile, Asha goes home to rant about this whole situation to Addy, who helpfully points out that Asha's getting way too involved here. Mm -hmm. Nina doesn't need... Nina doesn't need her or want her. She needs to move on before she makes a complete fool out of herself. Yes. This was good advice. Yes, it was. It was delivered directly, but it was still good advice. Yeah. Asha's upset by this, so Addy makes it up by throwing chocolates at her. Asha realises that she's been hoping Nina would fall back in love with her. You need to move on, says Addy. You can't always get what you want. But you get what you need. Exactly. <laughs> so I, did love, I did love this. This I loved. Of course. As, a- Asha and Addy just... They work so well together they as really brother do. and sister. Still you do. know? It's just... 
it's the one head change that I think really, really works really, really well. Is there a goose goats, dying in the Goats backyard? or a goose have moved in next door. <laughs> so Kev and Tim approach Bob the manager at the training ground and immediately... <laughs> Bob the manager. <laughs> immediately bring up the ITV Can Corey. he manage it? <laughs> no, yes, he can't. he can. <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> and they immediately bring up ITV Corey, the murderer. Bob points out that ITV Corey was found innocent. It means nothing, says Kev. Well... It doesn't really mean nothing. Tim wonders what kind of role model ITV Corey can be. Bob, the manager, hasn't anything else to say in the matter and leaves. And is he really that good of a player? Apparently We've so. We've never seen him play. We've well, never... We haven't seen James play either. Well, that's true. Or Tommy O. Have we seen Tommy O? I'm going to regret saying is it, that. Isn't Tommy O retired now? He's retired now, yeah. Yeah, because James took his spot. That's right. But then James has been out for a while. That's right. ITV Stefan goes to shout at Kev, so Kev threatens to hit him with an expensive looking tool. ITV Stefan runs away and Tim tells Kev. Okay, Tyrone. Or Tim tells Kev he's a fucking mess after all this and that you should start taking it easy. He's a shadow of his former self, says Tim. Back at Roy's Rolls, Nina has got Asha a cake to say thank you. They chat about uh, their relationship. Nina clumsily calling Asha a mate and Asha pretends to be cool as a cucumber about this, insisting that she's moved on anyway. Thank you, next, she says. Tim comes in to fill in Nina she's on... She's Ariana Grande now. To fill in... Well, that's your new crushes, apparently. And? Tim comes to fill in Nina on the county developments. He thinks enough is enough. Kev is a wreck now. Asha thinks Nina could do without the aggression and sadness too, what with her new uh, course starting up. But Nina doesn't think she can give up. Tim doesn't think that she has a choice, and that's as far as we get with that this week. Yes, just give up grieving. <laughs> no, you're de- you're you're dead. Here is a line in the sand. Right, all right. It's been it's been a month now. Just stop grieving your dead boyfriend who, who you has barely not knew. gotten any justice because his killer is walking free. And has just gotten a promotion. But just forget all about that and focus on this thing without thinking about all of that. You can do that, can't you? Swallow it down. <sighs> compress it into a bitter little ball. And, and just then release it at an inopportune moment. way down. Yeah. I did like her floral penny, though. Uh, Nina's. That, yeah, I approve of that very pretty. Well. Ash and Nina destined to get back together again? Please no. <sighs> no. Please no. Please don't. Please don't. It was cute at the time. Right. It was sweet at the time, but... It was replaced by a... Sorry, a, a better relationship. Yeah, which unfortunately ended in death. I, but I just... I, I mean, I, I was kind of saying they barely knew each other and the, the, the voice of mm-hmm. Tim in my head. Yeah. But it's still so sad that they, they did only have a really, really short period of time together. You know what I like, though? What? You know what I like? Nina's still wearing that ring, the little plastic ring. She is. That said proposed. Mm-hmm. With. I can see that being on her finger for quite some time. Yeah. It was a nice touch. I'm I'm glad. I'm glad that she's still that she's wearing it. It was it made me it made me very happy to see that still on her finger. That was that was a, that was a nice sweet touch. Yep. And a good attention to detail. Yeah, it's kinda like Tyrone's tattoo. That they'll probably forget to put on next time we see his leg. <laughs> At least you still got that ring on. What it reminded me of is um, is in the SpongeBob episode oh at, okay. Atlantis Square Pantis, where David Bowie plays LRH, the Lord Royal Highness of of Atlantis, and for some reason, for years, I thought it was Oliver Sacks and not David Bowie. But that has nothing to do with this story. Helen's talking about this without notes, by the way. <laughs> I am. But in the, in that particular SpongeBob episode, LRH has one green eye and one blue oh, that's eye. A nice touch. Just like David Bowie, which is just yeah, it was a nice touch. It was like, oh, look at the attention to detail of the animators of SpongeBob SquarePants. My friend Jim had two different colored eyes. Yeah. They kind of the one cuz it had a, a a brown and a blue. Mm-hmm. And the brown one had blue flecks. And the and some lights, yeah. it looked like they were the same color, and then they obviously went 
Yes, I had a crush on a boy in Montana who had one brown eye and one blue eye who ate dog food. What catch? <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Let's move on. I've oh, got no. your order of, of specially colored contact lenses <laughs> pending. I, I'm, I'm not sure what Kev expects people to do here. Well, I know what he expects to do, but realistically, Bob the manager, he can't, he can't withdraw well, someone okay. from the team. Here's the th- here is the thing though. They they really want to steer clear of any of any sort of bad press or people dredging things up. And let's... nobody knows that it was ITV Corey. None of his teammates. Bob seems to know. And and James knew. And you'd think everybody else at this point would know because the names were leaked, remember? Well, just for an hour. Yeah, but... Yeah, I don't know. The internet is forever. So you would think that they would want to... Oh, this guy just got off. This... The other person is just now getting, you know, her... What? What's the word? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Sentencing. And and they're going to, and this is the time that they choose to promote him up. It seems a bit weird that that would be happening right yeah. now, that they wouldn't be wanting to avoid. And especially when two fans come up and say, hey, this isn't cool. You'd think that they'd be like, oh, geez, you know, people do know who he is and everything. We don't really want this in the press. Maybe we shouldn't be promoting this guy quite yet. Yeah, Instead seem- of acting like he's this big, huge darling of the team when he can't be that good. No, the, this Weather County seem to, seem to be doing things with the sole intention of annoying Kev, Kev Tim, and Nina. Right. And it seems to be what, what their motivation is, right. which is just bizarre. Yeah, it doesn't make in, any sense. And again, it just it further makes me angry that a jury couldn't see can can see we Kelly right. kicking somebody to death, but not this superstar soccer player. Right. Football. Moving on. The next storyline this morning is the old ones are the best. <laughs> on Monday, Audrey is still in the mood about the Rita thing from last week and is threatening to sack David for some reason. Gail is dressed like one of the sand people from Star Wars and reckons it'll all blow over. Only she says it. Beep, 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 beep. Gail's meeting Audrey in Roy Rolls and Audrey cuts oh, no, to the wait, chase. Oh, no, wait, the sand people are the ones who went, oh! Yes, just like that. <laughs> Rita, it's like having Michael Walton from Police Academy sitting across from me. Rita is dead to her years of lies. Gail accidentally reveals that she knew all about it, as did everybody on the street, apparently. Audrey reacts badly to this decision. Well, it, only ha- it only started when she nipped Rita's ear, right. which was like, what, two years ago? Because I, I remember, remember that. I can't remember. I remember that. And yeah, if, 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 if Harmony nipped my ear, I probably would stop going to her and get a different hair dresser. My barber could cut my ear off and I'd still go. <laughs> Shona meets Audrey because he's local and he's he's nearby and he doesn't Scott talk to me. Scott could do it for you. He'd probably charge you more though because he works in a beauty salon, I not a barber's. I'm 15 bucks to get my head shaved. <laughs> 15 bucks? That's why you do it outside. Yeah, weather permitting. <laughs> Shona meets Audrey in the community garden. Shona hasn't a clue about the whole hair colouring thing so it's now Audrey's best friend. Audrey feels that a special bond between stylist and customer has been broken here. But now she's worried that she's not up to being a hairdresser anymore. She's too old and Shona offers encouragement. Shona explains to Gail that she's seen Audrey and she's still really upset and advises Gail to offer an Oliver an Oliver branch. An Oliver branch. <laughs> Yeesh. So Gail arranges to take Audrey out for a drink and invite her for a late special birthday tea thing. Shona also seems to indicate that she wants Audrey to give her a bob. Sure. So Audrey and Gail meet in Roy's Rolls for a vino. Audrey has her sympathy. What the fuck would you know? You're a cleaner, says Audrey. You're only 81, says Gail. You're not ready for the scrap heap yet. And tomorrow may bring some joy. 
Rita shows up asking for an appointment, but Audrey still isn't happy with her and nips off for a shite, allowing Gail to invite Rita to the birthday bash tomorrow. Yeah. Trying trying desperately to mend fences because mm-hmm. the custard slice didn't work. Right. Oh, when, when the custard you, slice doesn't work. Yeah, then you go to drastic so times, go to drastic measures. That's a song by The Verb, isn't it? <laughs> the custard slices don't work. They just make you worse. On Wednesday, Audrey meets up with Gail and Sarah in Roy's Rolls. Audrey is worried that folk think that she's passed it. Sarah reveals that they've organised a party for Audrey at the bistro later. Audrey remains underwhelmed and warns them uh, not to invite Rita. Gail swallows her chin a little bit. She's already invited. Mm-hmm. At the bistro, Audrey is disappointed to see that only David and Sarah in a leather skirt have turned up along with Gail. Intimate, says Gail. The and whispers... not Nick, who partly owns the bistro. <laughs> Couldn't be bothered to come up to, to show up for his great grandmother's <laughs> belated birthday for... for his grandmother's yeah yeah He's... he owns the place and he can't be bothered to show up they're finally getting know, a break I know I know I said Ben Price is finally getting a break but poor poor Jane Danson still has to work what makes Ben Price so special <laughs> why does why does Jane Danson still have to work and doesn't get a break and yet Ben Price gets a break huh huh how's that fair He's probably making 10% more than she is too. Oh, let's stay well clear of that. Uh, Intimate, says Gail, who whispers to Sarah that she couldn't get a hold of Rita. Audrey surprises everyone by ordering a soft drink. (gasps) What? (laughs) David's bought her a foot spa with a corn removal tool. Sarah's got her... (laughs) Sarah's got her... And it actually says corn removal on this box. It does. Ooh. Ooh. Sarah's got her a slang kit. Whatever the fuck that is. I think it's a, I think it's a snuggy. Mm. And Gail's got her a pair of slippers. Everyone has got her old lady presents. All of which I would love to receive. <laughs> Sarah thinks that maybe except they the sh- slippers. Sarah thinks that maybe they should have talked to each other. Because you buy me slippers like all the time. Well, you like slippers. Oh, do you know what it is? I bought you that one pair that you wore <laughs> until they were. Because you wore them outside, which you're not supposed to do with slippers. Mm. Anyway, Sarah thinks that they should have talked to each other, maybe. Then Rita comes in. You have got to be fucking kidding me, says Audrey. And she gets up and leaves. David reckons that he's keeping the foot spa. And, and, and Rita says, you know what? We're getting old. We just buried a friend. Let's just bury the hatchet, too. And she's right. And Audrey's like, nope. So she goes off to their car while Gail tries to stop her. Audrey is sick of being treated like she's dead in the ground or an old lush. She's had enough of this shit. And in the busy street, she puts her car into reverse, gives it a little bit too much welly, and backs straight into Rita's car. Oh, pig's tits, says Audrey. <laughs> and Rita is fucking furious. These yeah. are all witnesses to Audrey admitting guilt here. Aggie comes along to check everyone's okay and then talks about the parking regulations. Everyone ignores her. Rita <laughs> thinks Audrey shouldn't be driving and should be in a mobility scooter. Fuck this for a game of soldier, says Audrey, and she storms off, leaving her car slammed into Rita's on the street. Right, yeah, and Rita's like, wait a second. (laughs) What the hell? You're just going to walk away? So Gail, Audrey and Sarah go back to the bistro. Audrey claiming that Rita is blowing this out of all proportions. (laughs) Gail is worried that Audrey wasn't paying attention, but Audrey blames her for winding her up. Gail and Sarah gang up, wanting Audrey to have an eye test, and Audrey calls this ageist. Audrey calls her celebration misery from start to finish. Gail urges her to get an eye test again. Debbie passes and makes a pitch for the Horror Nation Street pop-up that they'll be doing in the run-up to Halloween. What an odd thing to say, says everyone. <laughs> I Hor- do love it, though. Horror Nation Street. Horror Nation it's Street. So why did they not do this? I know. Why, why is this not a Why did we not think year? of this? Why did you not think of this? Hmm? I was too busy. Hmm? I was too busy being reinfected but with strep by my husband. Well, you're... Going the right way to get re reinfected. <laughs> on Friday, Rita is meeting Audrey and Roy's Rolls. Rita's still butthurt, thinking that Audrey crashed into her car deliberately. Audrey apologises and offers to pay for the damages, but then Rita reveals that Gail's beat her to it and thinks Audrey should get her eyes tested. Fuck you, Rita, says Audrey, and she flinches off. At number eight, Gail is trying to talk David into having an intervention for Audrey and her eyesight. Gail thinks paying for the repairs will sweeten up uh, Audrey to do this for some reason. David is worried about what this means about Gail uh, paying to get the sinkhole fixed or her sinkhole fixed. Right, yes. All of a sudden, all of a sudden it's her house and her sinkhole. Mm-hmm. 
It's a and hole. Yes, it doesn't it. belong to anyone. And they argue about whose responsibility it is for a couple hmm. of hours, all of which is captured on screen. Audrey arrives. I wonder. I wonder because I wonder about how far down technically Gail does own of that property. Because you know, here in America, where there's where there's places with things that people really, really want underneath the ground still in some places. Right. You know, you only you know, only legally own so far down and then there's there there's like a, a limit and then anything underneath that is free game for anyone to just come in and dig out of your property. Like Mole Man. <laughs> yes. Mole Man is coming for for your oil. Yeah. And- you own the turtle you don't own any of the turtles that are below it. Right. All the way, the way down. down. I don't know what uh, property laws are in never, the UK. Never thought about it. Yeah. So Audrey is arrives there, at, Is there anything under the ground in the UK that people want? Uh, I think there's natural gas, isn't there? Is there? Well, there is in the North Sea. Yeah. Yeah. There's oil in there's, the North Sea as well. Yeah, there's stuff underneath the ground in Scotland that people want, I guess. Maybe not in England, though. Mm-hmm. And well done. And somewhere uh, in Karen Shore, not too far down, like maybe just a foot and a half, somewhere in Karen Shore, there's a almost entirely full jar of Coleman's English mustard. Hmm. I suppose there's Richard the Third. Yeah. True. Audio arrives at number eight for another intervention. Sarah and David are shocked to learn that this is going to take all afternoon. They have work to go to after all. David speeds through the process by just stealing Audrey's car keys out of her bag. Now go get your eyes checked. On the download, You're funny. On the download, Audrey arranges to meet Max in the community garden and bribes him to get her keys back, pointing out that she saw him nicking sweets out of the cabin earlier. So to keep her sweet, Max agrees. Was it was it earlier that day? I thought that this was ins- that she was kind of insinuating that he did this when he was a wee boy. Oh, maybe I wasn't sure. And it, quite it frankly, doesn't really don't matter. Really care. The the fact of the matter is, though, this is just reinforcing that this this family is terrible mm-hmm. about hiding their lives and and covering for one another because Max learned nothing from that too. It's, it's they've all been going to uh, Fizz and Tyrone's course of exceptional parenting. <laughs> In the community centre. By lying for your children (laughs) until the problem becomes untenable. Yep. So Max delivers, but Gail has been following and demands the keys back. Audrey tells her to suck it. You'll have to wrestle them out of my cold dead hands. Back home, Audrey crows that the last time they watched Tipping Point, she got three questions right and Gail got none. So maybe Gail needs her head checked out. Gail says that she does get it checked out every year. Right, yeah. And also, your eyes and your brain are two different things. I thought it was... The mention of tipping point made me... <laughs> would be quite happy. Yes. You and Audrey are the same person, aren't you? I'll get my eyes checked. I'll get my eyes checked next month. <laughs> and I'm going to do a you. I'm going to get a pair of uh, prescription sunglasses as well. Oh, because fancy. Because I really missed them this year. Fancy. But it does, it does take an awful lot to get you to go to the doctor's. Oh, yeah, yeah. Earlier in this episode. I don't think we spent a whole banter worth talking about that. Correct. So who's Audrey going to kill? <sighs> As I said, Super Soap Week. We've got the sinkhole, we've got the parking situation, we've got Audrey's eyesight. You can't have a character being told to get their eyes checked as many times as Audrey's Doesn't she told. have an appointment next week? I think, did Gail make an appointment? Yes, She's Gail's not going to it. She said so often that she's not going to get her eyes tested. She's refusing this. Which is just ridiculous. So you can't do that that many times and, and then also, not have something ironic have, happen later. How does she still have a license if she hasn't got her eyes checked in a while? She's over the age where you would think that that would be a requirement. Quite frankly, I'm amazed that Rita and Audrey still have their licenses. I'm amazed that they've still got cars. Why have they got cars? They don't go anywhere. At least Audrey's back and forth to Grasmere Drive. Where does Rita go? To visit Emily in my, Scotland. My Christmas trees <laughs> that she can later get trapped under. Anyway, has Rita been a bit of a cow? No, Audrey's a cow. I think Rita's been a little bit of a cow. Uh, no, no, no. 
Audrey backed into her car. Rita tried to bury the hatchet. Rita was being... And Audrey's back. No. I, Rita did I nothing really wrong that. with the whole Claudia thing to begin with because, in fairness, Audrey did cut her ear with scissors. So Rita is... It, it's a free country. She can go get her hair cut and styled and dyed by anyone she wants. It's a friendship thing, though. And Audrey is just, she's just a, she's either drunk or she's a cow <laughs> on the show. She, they've really just dumbed down her character a lot, haven't they? The, well, you, no you watch classic. Strength and empathy and kindness in her. And I don't know this, you're talking about change that's far more uh, recent. recent, but you watch classic and... I know she was a bad about, mother to Gail. Yeah, and it's all about Gail hating Leanne and Nick being the untouchable. David and Sarah aren't really old enough to be have storylines and be in it at this point. We're talking right. 1999. But they're really opinionated, strong, frequently wrong, mm -hmm. but you know they're, they're still vocal and contributing people and characters. And they've... They, and I agree, I think this has happened years ago for Gail. Gail's mm -hmm. been a comedy character for years. Mm -hmm. And it's when she's not a comedy character that you realise, oh, fucking hell, Helen Worth can still... Uh, Act? Can still deliver really emotional stuff yes. when she's given it. Yes. But they've dumped her down and made her comedic. They're doing the kind of same way ordered. So now the two of them are just like two old women. Yeah. Who are vaguely aware of what's going on around about them. Right. And it's... It's not entirely yeah. satisfying. It's kind of funny, though. Yeah. And, and the fact that Audrey is, is a bit of a lush is... And a cow. Well, yeah. You know, and Rita, at least, seems to still be, along with Roy, the heart and soul of the street. She's the one who talked Frida down last week and is the one lots of people go to for advice. And she sits, she sits in her booth. In the rovers. Occasionally sings. Occasion yeah. Occasionally sings and is just constantly giving people people are constantly going to her, Oh Rita, tell us about the good old days. When when life was simpler. Did you ever have relationship problems like this, Rita? And oh, let me tell you about the time. That, that tends to be when I tune into a tipping point. Right, yes. She just needs a shawl and a corn cob pipe and a, a rocking chair and she she'd be She'd be my gran. <laughs> Moving on then. Gracie Snaglist. <laughs> on Monday, Ed is having a couple with Danny at Roy's Rolls. Well, uh, when Paul comes in to complain about how low they are on supplies, Ed explains that they have some cash flow problems at the moment, but he's going to sort it out. And Danny checks that everything is okay. Ed insists it was nothing. Danny is now in Roy's Rolls with James and reveals his concerns about Ed and the whole cash flow problem thing. Mm -hmm. James I knew can't it. believe I knew it. Danny was going to be the key to this. Ed has been working his arse off, so Danny then tells James about the encounter Aggie had with Grace last week when uh, Aggie called Grace a money grabber. It's probably nothing. So James comes home and confronts Ed and Aggie, and the whole story comes out about Grace and the rent free new house and Ed working day and night on the snag list, all of which to keep glory in their lives. And later, Ed comes home from fixing two snags only for Grace to add three new ones. James comes in with exciting news. He's transferred 15 grand into their joint account. He's not prepared to sit back and let the family fail and fall apart again. And no one says thanks to him. And that's as far as we get with that this week. Yeah. So as they we said to, last week, they start to protest. speak to James. Yeah. Ask James for it. He'll, they start, he'll they, help you. They protest a little bit, and which still just boggles my brain that they have him living in their house rent free mm -hmm. when he makes more than anybody else in that house probably more than anybody in the street and there's been that one time where james you know got money for that story 50 grand ago right and offers to give some of that money to his mother and she's like no 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 that money is for you well <laughs> take the money from your children it's fine mm -hmm. Please take your money from your children. If your children are over the age of 20 and they're living in your house, charge rent. You don't have to charge a lot of rent, but charge rent. Yep. You know, expect them to help out. Yep. This, they're adults now. He's yep. an adult. Yep. 
He's the only one who wants to be an adult in that house. <sighs> so it's still frustrating that the Baileys seem to only have that one white friend <laughs> in Paul. Yeah. Well, yeah. although there's, there's although there's some Aggie and Sally stuff, which we'll get to next. Right. Which I kind of enjoy. I Yeah. That but, I do but enjoy. What we've, we've got is this compartmentalized storyline that essentially is the black people on the street and the, the only other instance mm-hmm. if we ignore Aggie and Sally, which we haven't talked about, mm-hmm. when Aggie turns up at the car crash. Right. And she really is ignored. Yeah. It's like... There's a little bit of, like, no, 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 we're fine. Who are you and why are you contributing to this? Right. Which is an interesting tack to take, that they they seem to be blatantly doing this now. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, in fairness to Aggie, Audrey is old. Even even a small little backup uh, like that. She was going could, at some speed. It wasn't could, fast, but could I would cause, imagine Wright should have Could cause some something. whiplash or a sprain or something. She right. should go get checked out. And if they had gotten, if they had insisted that she go get ki- checked out, if Rita had called the police, which she really should have done, especially when Audrey walked away. Yep. It's a hit and run or a hit and stroll. Audrey would have gotten her eyes checked. Mm-hmm. And she probably would have been required to take an eye test to get her license and have her license revoked. You know, this so easily could have been taken care of if they hadn't ignored the one black lady on the street. She right, she crashed into a stationary car. Yeah. That's kind of like you didn't see it then. Right. Because what el- other, or you weren't paying attention because what other explanation right. is there? It didn't suddenly appear out of nowhere. No. Anyway, our penultimate storyline <sighs> this morning is Campaign Sally. On Friday, <laughs> Tim is with Sally. Very nice. Thank you. And Roy's rolls. Tim's got his eyes on Sally's bap, but not like that. No. She changes the subject to the clean air parking campaign thing and remembers that she sent tons of emails to the council that she's not got a reply for. We need to give this campaign a boot up the arse, she says. Right, right up, up the, the arse. arse. Then she just eats a roll to spite Tim. Yeah, she's decided that she is hungry after all. It's 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 funny because she's like he's like, You could eat that. And she's like, well, I'm deciding whether or not I'm still hungry, you mm-hmm. know, which is the right thing to I'm do. I'm still hungry, system. Yes. As he eyes <laughs> that bam so lustily. Yep. There is lust in his eyes yes, for indeed. that sandwich. So outside, Sally spots a councillor parking his car on the street. She accosts him as <laughs> former mayor Sally, Sally Metcalf. Why haven't you replied to my emails? And the councillor has a tram to catch, mm. but promises to get back to her. Oh, so you're just parking here for your tram. So you're one of the people that's causing this problem. I'm parking legally, he says. Yeah, see? So Sally tries Just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's right. right. Sally's trying to get Let's Aggie... Let's all remember that slavery was legal once. ...to up her involvement in the campaign. And also, Tim thinks that he's like a movie star. <laughs> he thinks that he was on Downton Abbey. Abbey. <laughs> And she spots Fergus, pointing out that if they install parking regulations on Coronation Street, he'll have a wheen of tickets to issue. And Fergus comes in his pants a wee bit of this. <laughs> he does! But, but can do nothing to help, not even when Aggie is forced to throw her two pence into the ring. Right, while desperately trying to get into her house. Right, <laughs> get away from this conversation. You know what? I really love Tim this week, except when he's telling Nina right. to throw away her grief. When the councillor comes back, Sally films him driving away on her phone. The councillor points out that he's doing nothing wrong, but the local cat sanctuary is looking for volunteers, he says. Sticks and stones, says Sally. Sticks and stones. And also, go fuck yourself with that crazy cat lady shit. (laughs) And that's as far as we get with that this week. Do you think think Sally's going to run for council person? Again? I hope so. She's great at this. She is good at this. (laughs) Aggie and Sally friends. It did seem that Aggie was trying to get away. But they have, yeah. There is a friendship there, I think. Right. It would be a shame. Because she'd been helping her before. It's a shame that they hadn't been. It's a shame that we haven't seen more of this whole um, Aggie and Sally versus the cars thing. Because if we had seen more of it, then we could have maybe established that they are friends. And then maybe if we've established that they're friends, then maybe 
Sally is somebody Aggie can turn to when she's troubled with things like blackmail. Right, and this is something that I really don't want to see them rejecting because this is an opportunity for Aggie and therefore the other Baileys to be more involved in, in, the street. in other people's right. storylines. Yeah, it's like when when Tim and Kev finally remember that <laughs> James Bailey lives on the street and, and goes to, to talk to him this one time about this one thing because they need something from him. It's like they only remember when they want in, when they want free tickets or an autograph right. or to get somebody kicked off the team. Right. <laughs> oh, That's the only time right. any of these white people talk to James Bailey. Remember the whole Sean thing when Sean thought yeah, he was getting those tickets from James for free. And then remember, and then James is like, no, man, you still have to pay for them. Right. Is there anything better than Sally with a cause? No. <laughs> Sally, when no. she gets her teeth into something, she's she's never given up. Yes. She reminds me of me before the pandemic threw me into deep anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kills your tenacity a little bit. You know, we bet. But Sally's still... Sally's still got it. Because the show has forgotten that there's a pandemic on. So once again, I Except think for that though, one little sign on that one bench outside the hospital. But we're again, this is something that we're being reminded of in the lead up to the Super Soap Week, mm. the parking situation. Mm. And I thought the parking situation was really to serve the Liam storyline. Well, yeah, Liam with asthma. Right. That, Does everybody remember that Liam has asthma? <laughs> well, because we've just been reminded that Max has ADHD. Mm-hmm. Is anybody going to remember that that David has? has uh epilepsy and and craig has ocd like i said in the intro we're forgetting that natasha insisted that she was going to pay to fix the sinkhole right yeah so what happened to that gail does mention in fairness gail does say well didn't natasha say she was gonna know what gail said was i might ask natasha for some of it right natasha offered to pay for it yeah insisted on paying for it yeah what happened because if sam is going to be here I don't I want, want him a to fucking be safe. bottomless pit. Right. Six feet away from so him. So we assumed at that point that this thing was going to get fixed. And it's still not fixed. And they only sometimes remember that it exists. This is a plot point waiting to happen. So many things. The parking regulations is a plot point waiting to happen. Audrey's eyesight is a plot point waiting to happen. This is this is da- the... Daniel's lasagna is a plot point <laughs> waiting to happen. This is the problem with consistency on a show that's been on this long is that... You have to stay consistent and you have to remember these things and not just when they come up as plot points. Check off sinkhole. This is this is where Doctor Who is just so brilliant in that he, Doctor Who regenerates every once in a while and so then you can throw consistency out the window because it doesn't matter because it's a different person. Here, though, I think we are going to have these callbacks. We just need to see Audrey regenerate. <laughs> and like John Pertwee. Fuck did that happen? They have the same hair. <laughs> so nobody notices. <laughs> now there's a story. And the same cheekbones actually too. Our final storyline today. <laughs> Just a shame he's dead. Unlikely proposal. Is he? I think so. Oh, I guess he must be. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> On Monday, Imran goes to see Kelly ahead of her sentencing tomorrow, but Kelly isn't really in the mood for talking. She has a very nihilistic view on her chances of leniency. Imran promises again not to give up on her which he's done a a million times. At the law office, Adam is angry that Imran isn't keeping up with his other legal caseload. Imran promises to be back on it once he gets uh, the Kelly thing out of the way. And later, Sabine drops into the law office with a proposition. She wants Imran to work on a lucrative high-profile case with her. She hands him a file and it turns out to be Harvey. Oh, pig stits to this, says Imran. Can can I just interrupt you very quickly? Mm -hmm. John Pertwee is indeed dead. (laughs) Breaking news. Thank God. He died in 1996 in Connecticut. 96? 96. So he's, so he's been dead for over 20 years. <laughs> so late breaking news. Breaking news. <laughs> if any of our listeners have been affected by the death of John Pertree. <laughs> in Connecticut, 1996. We have our sympathies. <laughs> yeah, he'd be uh, over 100 years old if he was still alive. Our, so Our love to his... Uh, his descendants, who are probably now by this point also dead. <clears throat> Sarah, 
Sabine insists that Harvey is misunderstood and there's two sides to every story. Emran reminds his involvement with Leanne and Simon and Sabine is confident that they can get him off just ignoring this this massive point. And Imran's moral compass isn't as high as he'd like to think after what happened the other week, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's just it's just a minor inconvenience that he tried to have your partner's sister killed. For all, for all intents and purposes, your sister-in-law. Yeah, it's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Everybody will understand because money. Sabine is Mr. Krabs. <laughs> she, money, 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 money. No, SpongeBob. I'm boy. Mr. Krabs, and I like money. <laughs> she advises he reconsider. It's a no-brainer. A good fund to Kelly's appeal, sh- should she get one. Toy and Imran are having lunch at the bistro. He explains about Sabine's offer, but doesn't go into the, the minutia of the detail. Uh, Toya trusts Imran, but not Sabine. But knows Imran will make the right decision. Back at the law office, Imran tells Sabine that he wouldn't touch the Gaskell case with a shitty stick, supposing he was on fire, and shitty sticks would extinguish that fire. <laughs> Smell you later then, says Sabine, and she leaves. At home, Imran explains that he's turned Sabine down. He didn't believe in the case, and now he doesn't have to work with her. We don't have to worry about that cow again, says Imran, <laughs> ominously. On Wednesday, sleepy Imran is in Roy's roles, moving words around in his argument for Kelly the Chin's sentencing, but he doesn't think it's going to be enough. He and Toya worry about how she's going to react afterwards, given her uh, the attempt on her life mm-hmm. a few weeks ago. Kev's chat with Debbie, wondering if Abby will show up for today's hearing, and Debbie promises to go along for moral support. This doesn't feel like justice, says Kev. Sabine is at the court picking up the transcripts for Harvey's trial, or so she says, and bumps into Tim. Imran, who's, Very still, convenient. Right, who's still moving words around. Toya walks in on him, a little confused, until Imran explains Sabine is there for another reason. At the court, Kev is waiting for the last minute for Abby, but she doesn't show up, so while the proceedings begin, Debbie decides to take Kev for a drink. Kev mistakes the back of a woman's head as being Abby. That doesn't look not nothing one like, thing Abby. like Abby. Not one. The hair colour is wrong, the hair style is wrong, the height is wrong. Everything is wrong. This woman looks nothing like Abby from the front or the back. It's like if I was walking through and he shouted at me, Abby! <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking to? It reminds me of when I was a child and my dad was in the Navy and my mom and I were on the base and I ran up to a man in uniform oh dear. <laughs> shouting, Daddy, 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 and hugging his leg, much to the consternation and confusion of his girlfriend. To whom he swore he had never seen me before in his life. This happened <laughs> Which three, was true. This happened three weeks ago, listeners. <laughs> inside, Gary takes up... Inside, Gary turns up while the prosecution makes a case for a longer sentence. The prosecution actually doing something for a change. Yeah. Imran makes a series of pleas for leniency due to Kelly's upbringing, how her dad even killed Imran's sister, which is yet another reason why Imran shouldn't be anywhere near this case. Right, and I was... I was impressed that he brought that up, but I was surprised that he never said, you know, look, her dad did this awful thing to me and to my family, and yet I still believe in her, and I forgive her because her family has nothing to do with with her. You know, there are different people. Uh, The judge thinks it over for a bit. She calls it murder, even if it wasn't premeditated, and gives Kelly life with a minimum of 15 years. After the sentencing, Sabine comes in on Imran and Toya. Imran isn't pleased to see her, but Sabine thinks it could have been worse. Kev comes along and gives Sabine a mouthful of abuse, and when Imran tries to calm Kev, Kev elbows Imran in the nose like Bruce Lee, sending Imran flying, killing him instantly. (laughs) So in a contrived, convoluted turn of events, Toya stays at the court to keep an eye on Kelly, while Sabine takes Imran to hospital for his nasal boo-boo. Imran goes to the hospital. Mm-hmm. Audrey doesn't. Yeah. At the hospital, Sabine. Well, reckons, Audrey's not bloody. And neither is Imran. No, he's got some jam around his nose. A tiny amount of jam. Yeah. One's little pots cute that you little, get in restaurants. Cute little not even spots. What jam? Cute little spots of jam. Sabine reckons Imran should press charges. <laughs> Imran thinks that's a stupid idea. It was just an accident. Kev's just frustrated Sabine's with the system. Sabine's just an ambulance chaser, isn't she? And Imran's nose was an innocent bystander in the whole episode. Sabine wants to use this time to talk to Imran into helping her on the Gasco case. Get the fuck, says Imran. Back in the street, Toya sees Gary and thanks him for his support uh, for Kelly earlier today. Gary knows how important Kelly is to her and Imran, judging by the nick that Imran was in the other week after the sentencing. When pressed, Gary explains that he saw Imran in town going into a bar. 
so let's confuse his Toya because according to Imran, he was he's sleeping in the, in the law office. Yeah. So Toya phones Kelly, who is in her nice wee telephone room in prison. Kelly asks to speak to Imran, so Toya has to explain what happened with Kev's elbow and Imran's nose. Toya downplays it's a scuffle, but Kelly thinks he's getting targeted because of her, which isn't really true. No. Imran needs to move on, she says. So Imran's ready to leave hospital for his bloody nose and Sabine offers to give him a ride home. Imran refuses. You weren't so quick to knock me back the other day of the verdict, says Sabine. And Toya comes in at this point, worried for Imran, and now worried that yet again she's walked in on the two of them together. Right. It's like, why? Because supposedly she stayed at the courthouse to keep an eye on Kelly. To make sure she didn't immediately try to kill herself. Yeah. Right. And yet... She's at home when she calls Kelly to check up on her and make sure that she's okay. And then went back to the hospital because Imran's been away for so long. And and yeah, and then doesn't immediately go to. You'd think that once. First of all, why is she calling Kelly when she stayed at the courthouse to check up on Kelly and to be there for Kelly? I don't know. And why once she took care of Kelly, didn't she immediately go to the hospital because she does not. She rightly does not trust Sabine. None of this makes any sense. No. It's just contrived to give it's, Imran and Sabine more time together. It's moving deck chairs about. Yes. So Sabine leaves and Imran explains that she was trying to get him to work for her again. Back home, Debbie is explaining to Jack about Horror Nation Street. Yeah, great, says Jack. Will you quit going on about fucking Horror Nation Street? Because according to the Way the County site, ITV Core has been promoted to the first team and this arguably should have been in another story. But it does, however, bring us to this week's hard debate. Kevin Jack were astonished to learn that ITV Corey has been promoted to the Weather County first team and will be on the bench for the cup game against Shrewsbury. Mm. But how should the team use ITV Corey in this important matchup? Mm. Injury replacement only, play for the last 20 minutes, sub for James in the second half, or force ITV Corey into a confession? Mm. Well, considering James isn't even playing. Yeah, I thought he'd be playing. He's not playing. No. The results are thus. Injury replacement only, 7%. Playing for the last 20 minutes, 12%. Sub for James in the second half, 19%. Or force him into a confession, a whopping 62%. Yeah. How, how, would, they, how would they do that, though? How would they force him into a confession? Waterboard him. <laughs> any, any follow-up questions? Okay, good. No. At home, Toya challenges... and. Imran on Sabine asking if there's anything going on and then revealing what Gary told her about the night of the verdict. Imran insists that he wasn't with Sabine, he just went there to get drunk and he felt ashamed. He needed a break. Toya doesn't think this is like him, but Imran promises that he's committed to Toya. She's all he cares about. So Toya goes off to run a bath and leaving Imran to call Sabine, saying that he needs to meet her. What a lovely surprise, says Sabine. Mm -hmm. So on Friday, Imran's, Sarcastically. Imran's making toast. Oh, there's nothing like toast in the morning. And Toya is apologising for letting her mind run away from her. She invites him to a lunch at the bistro later, but he says he'll be chained to his desk all day, keeping Adam happy. But not like that. <laughs> Thank you. Emran is visiting Kelly. <laughs> Creates an image, doesn't it? Mm. It's not a bad image. It's it's really not. Emran is visiting Kelly, explaining <laughs> explain about Kev's one-inch punch and promising to work on her appeal. He pushes her <laughs> back in the room. He pushes, I'll be in my bunk. <laughs> he pushes her to see the psychologist, but Kelly's unsure. It feels weird. So Imran offers to sit in. We've lost it. So Imran offers to sit in on the next session. In an hour, Imran quickly forgets his other appointments. Or rather, he doesn't forget them. He says, no, you can, this is more important. Mm -hmm. So in the therapy session, Kelly is explaining how she feels about the sentencing and how she's ignored the coping strategies from the last session, but having Imran and Toya on her side is helping. At the factory, Michael sees a pensive Toya immersed in her own thoughts. Michael suggests that they make time for each other by taking a bistro lunch to the law office. What a belting idea, says Toya. Yeah, And again, the show remembers that Michael works at the factory right. only when it continues and furthers a plot in another storyline. That has nothing to do with him. <sighs> Imran is rushing along the street and speed walks by Adam, who needs Imran's help at 2pm to sweet talk a new client. Imran doesn't have time. He has something he urgently needs to take care of, but he promises to be along later. Mm -hmm. 
So Tori goes to the law office to see Imran with a lovely lunch takeaway from the bistro. Adam isn't sure that Imran even works here anymore. <laughs> and who's this Carla that people keep on talking about? <laughs> he dingied a meeting and was last seen speed walking to the Rovers. Toy leaves the lunch with Adam and storms off. Toy and, tracks Adam and down. Adam, Adam looks pleased with what's in the bag. And he has a little peek inside. What's the bag? Quite cute. What's in the bag? John Doe has the upper hand. So Toy tracks and run down to the Rovers beer garden at an all shifty, texting and avoiding work. He's clearly hiding something. Spill your shit, says uh, Toy. So Imran insists that he's meeting a client, but Toya senses Sabine about to sneak in the, the back gate into the, the uh, beer garden, and then she hurries away. And then Toya comes right out and excuses him of seeing her. Imran insists that he's telling the truth, but Toya points out his old lies and the night of the verdict, and nothing he says will change it. Maybe I should speak to Sabine, says Toya. So Imran comes clean. He spent the night at Sabine's after all, but nothing happened. He insists he ended up on her couch, drunk, and uh, he didn't say anything about it because he was ashamed. Toy believes him, but is still fuming about it. Toy is no mug though, and she meets Sabine in the bistro to get her side of the story without Imran being there. Sabine's story checks out. Imran was too drunk to fuck, even if he wanted to, but she didn't. Nothing mm-hmm. happened. Toy appreciates her honesty and explains how worried that she was when Imran didn't come home, and Sabine's face says, wait, what? But she gets away with it. Mm-hmm. So Sabine goes to see Imran now and tells him what a naughty boy he's been. She's stuck to the story, but it's not the whole story, isn't it? Where did you disappear to in the middle of the night, she asks. And then she asks Imran to reconsider working on Harvey's appeal. It's not blackmail. It just happens to be male that's black. Uh, Quid pro quo. Mm -hmm. In In legal terms. In legal terms. Back home, Toya has pretended to make curry for dinner. She apologises for feeling so insecure and admits to speaking to Sabine. Imran doesn't blame her for being suspicious, but wants to draw a line under it. I'm so lucky, says Toya. No, I'm so lucky, says Imran. And that brings us to the end of this week's episodes. Mm. So where was Imran? Mm. I've seen some theories. I've seen some theories too. I'm not, I'm not happy about the theories that I've seen. No, me neither. Was mm. Imran with Abby? Mm. There was some sexual innuendo there with them in the... In the Garden of Revelations. Oh, an upgrade to the garden. <laughs> garden of relevatory metaphor. Yeah. Uh, you know. Some weeks ago. Yes, when, when Abby said, well, you know, maybe I should get off with Sabine. That whole conversation. Right. But I see that I see it more as Imran bumping into Abby trying to score and and keeping her safe and and getting her home more than Imran shagging Abby. Right. Because, first of all, let's remember, he was too drunk to fuck. Mm -hmm. Which, it's very interesting that in less than two months, we have two very different storylines that revolve around a man being too drunk to cheat. Right. So, I don't... So I'd like to think that, you know, it's awkward because he was with someone else, but that nothing happened still in that someone else? Well, can we do this twice? Because it was with Sabine and nothing happened. So it was with Sabine and nothing happened and it was with someone else and nothing happened. How long does this uh, chain of turtles go? Right. Yeah. Because, you know, there are only so many hours in a night. Right, for nothing to happen. Right. And for him to drunkenly stumble back onto the street the next day where he bumps into Gary and then but Nina. Wait, was, Abby was still at home, though. She slept on the couch. She did sleep on the couch, but why was she sleeping on the couch? That did confuse me. Mm-hmm. about. The, and remember, she slept on the couch and then immediately broke up with Kev and stormed off to go stay with her cousin. That's true. This is all starting mm. to add up, unfortunately. But where mm. would they have gone? Mm. Does Imran have a car? I don't think he does, because he was getting a ride home with Sabine. Hmm. Were they in the office? At the Chariot Square Hotel? Hmm. I mean... This is starting to 
hold water at least. I mean, I hope it isn't this. I I prefer Abby with anyone other than Kev. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Abby and Kev either anymore. Can Imran possibly work for Harvey? No, that, that can't I, possibly I happen. That, it's bad enough him. You can, and we, why? We, we can say that him working for Kelly the Chin has kind of been uh, justified a little bit by everyone now, now knowing that Kelly was innocent and deserved somebody to try and get her off right. because she was wrongly accused of it. Yeah. But this is a completely different matter altogether. Right. Yeah. This is him now supposedly defending somebody that everyone knows is guilty. Right. And why does Sabine so desperately want him on this case? To do what? Right. What is he supposed to be doing and why do, Why will she not let this go? And why is she resorting to blackmail? Is it just, it, does she still have a thing for Imran? Which, to be fair. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Why she would be so, you know, unless she still wants, unless she wants to get him back and he's trying, she's trying to, or she's she trying to. She doesn't need to do this though. She doesn't need Or him. she's trying to ruin his life because of know. what he did to her. Because wasn't he the one who cheated? He cheated on her, yeah. Yeah. So. Meh. Who knows? It's very convoluted. And how does it tie into the sinkhole? Right. And it's got to. <laughs> Probably, but I don't know. We're, we're trying to. My, my only hope is that we're trying so hard to pull Imran down into a kind of darker place and become a darker character with these uh, the the curiosity about mm-hmm. his whereabouts and the maybe the involvement in the Harvey case and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, kind of makes me think that, but by being that obvious about it, it's going to go in a different direction. Yeah, because I, I don't. I kind of like it. Imran having at least yeah. some kind of moral compass. Right, yeah. As as I pointed out um, to, on, on Twitter, you know, he's really the only heterosexual man under the age of 50 on the street who's decent. A decent guy. Yeah. Yep. He's yeah. had his moments. Because Never because been. it was because it was you know she's like honestly I ship it I was like well I do hate Abby with Kev you know she couldn't do much worse except for maybe Chesney or Yikes. Tyrone <laughs> and then I'm like ah oh, God they really they really just none of these men know how to have a relationship and I guess it is a soap opera so that's kind of the point, the point yeah. but still. You should have more than just one who's decent and doesn't... Well, he is lying to his partner. Continually at this point. not great. No. But and badly. Yeah. <sighs> he, he in the same scene said, I'm telling you the truth. I didn't do this thing. Here's a, a little piece of evidence. Okay, so I did this thing, <laughs> but I didn't do this other thing. Right, yeah. Well, if I... Why do I believe any of that? Yeah, now? I don't know. I don't know. Imran seems reluctant. Or Adam seems reluctant to put up with Imran's bullshit for very much longer. You know, I'm glad. I'm glad that that happened. I'm glad that they have Adam saying, "Hey, remember we're partners. Remember mm. that you have to have more clients than just the one who can't pay you." <laughs> right. You know, and as Barlow's legal services here, right? It's, Imran is. For all intents and purposes, renting half a desk here. Right. He's like a... Why don't they have separate desks? <laughs> Why is there always so much paper clutter on that desk? Yeah, but it doesn't seem to do very much. Yeah, I would. I would be concerned about my privacy if if I hired either one of them. Yeah, that, I think that's been brought up a few times. <laughs> Once or twice. Oh well, that oh, was the well. week that was Coronation Street. What was your moment of the week? Ah, uh, I have to think about this. I have a suggestion. What is your suggestion? I, I, well, I have several suggestions, but they're mm. all Sally based. <laughs> is it Sally taking pictures from behind a bush? Yes. I thought it was brilliant. Because she appears and then she disappears and then she comes running around the bush. It's just so good. 
<laughs> or just the whole, uh, the whole film and the counselor getting in his car when he's doing absolutely nothing wrong. <laughs> I love that. And well, I also love the he's not doing sticks and stones, counselor. Sticks and stones. He's not doing anything illegal. I think there's an argument for whether or not it's right. He's parking his car somewhere where he's allowed to park his car, where lots of other people are parking their cars. Right, but where him parking his car there means that people who actually live on that street can't park their cars. Boo-hoo. And it is a residential, mostly street. Mm -hmm. There there should be uh, permits on it. Yeah, there should be tram parking. Why is there no tram parking? Because it's in the middle of a residential area. (laughs) There's no place to put parking. You'd have to knock some houses down. Wait. Sh- and and the last thing we tried to do that, we sent the guy to jail. It's true. You'd think, with some you'd, sexual, you'd you know, think stuff that going on. people would be okay with making that what was it, a mill that they were gonna knock down? No, it was a brewery. Yeah, the brewery. They should make that into a parking garage. <laughs> Great. Or knock it down and build a parking garage. That's what would happen here. Moment of the week. There was something that I really liked, and I can't remember what it was, but it was also Sally based. It was it was, <laughs> it was Sally and Tim and that sandwich. <laughs> and Sally decided that she was hungry after all. Are you seriously pitching Sally being hungry after all as our moment of the week? You're pitching Sally filming behind a bush. Yes, I am. <laughs> What makes Sally feel me we had a bush better than Sally being hungry after all? Because it advances a storyline. <laughs> Sally being hungry after all it doesn't. Eh. <laughs> Meh. I'm not just Tim... doing the, the bush thing. The, the, that whole scene is yeah. my moment of the week. But I think out of out of everybody, the person that I enjoyed the most was Tim this week. Is it Tim thinking that that councilman... <laughs> No, no, (laughs) no, it isn't. That's part of that whole storyline that you like so much. That that, that as a moment doesn't do anything for it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Sally's Bush. Sally's Bush is our moment of the week. week. Thank you. you just wanted an excuse to say Sally's Bush, I didn't think, you? I think you were the one that, that said it. Your boring moment of the week. <laughs> <laughs> David pointed out that the foot spa will remove corns. That's this week's title, by the way. Corn removal tool. Yeah. I quite enjoyed him going through the, the, the pointed features. Pointed out all the different features of that box. Mm-hmm. It's like they printed that box just so people could read it. <laughs> right. Good job if you can get it. Right, yeah. I mean, I agree that that was all funny, but the joke went on too long. There there was too much of reading of the box so that by the point you get to the corn removal thing, which I think was supposed to be the punchline of that, that joke, line, yeah. it's just you just don't care anymore. Yeah. The joke went on too long. Okay, fair enough. Audrey's foot spa. That's a well, no, the... boring moment of the week. David pointing out the corn removal on the foot spa is our a... boring moment of the week. Right. Also, I want that slanket. I quite fancy the foot spa. It was quite. Me. It was quite. It, all of it, but the slippers. I will take. I will take it off your hands. It does look like a, a snuggie. There's got to be a difference between a snuggie, a slanket. And a snuggle sack, which is something that I just remembered was a thing. If you know what that is, write in to tell us about it. We're the talk of the street at gmail.com. We're at Cory Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can check me and Helen the coffee by heading to ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com slash the talk of the street. Check out the clicky clicky section of voggle.co.uk for links to our merch store and YouTube channel. And if you're so inclined, please leave a rating and a review on the iTunes or your podcast provider of choice. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode and we will be back next week with more The Talk of the Street. The Talk of the Street. Bye. Cheerio.